since there are so many different notions of, of what is a multiverse, I think it, it's, uh, it's quite useful to, to sort of categorise them, and th that has been done. So there are multi-multiverses? Yeah, yeah, different. There's, there's a hierarchy of uh, multiverses. And uh, a guy called Max Tegmark, very well-known physicist, he's uh, classified them into four levels, so varying levels of controversy. So, well, so we'll begin with level one multiverse. So what Tegmark calls a level one multiverse. And this is basically the idea that there is stuff beyond the observable universe. So we think of the, we talk about the observable universe, which is basically it's around 10 to the, I think, 26 meters distance, something like that, that order of magnitude. So big distance scales. That's as far as the eye can see, essentially. That's the furthest away you can go that light could have reached us from, in principle, since the beginning of the universe. So pretty big distance scale. But what's beyond that? That's a legitimate question. And this is the notion of, of a level one multiverse. The universe is, if you like, the existence beyond that. It would strike me as still being a universe. Well, I, I would agree, but in a sense, they're completely disconnected from us. So in a sense that they are distinct. You might think that region beyond the, the observable horizon that we call, you know, the, the cosmological horizon, is not very big. But it could be enormous. The universe could be absolutely ginormous. One of the reasons that you can make it big is due to something called its eternal inflation. So we know that why our universe around us, our corner of the universe, we, we think it got big because at some point it just grew very quickly due to something called an inflaton. It expanded out very, very fast, got very, very big. Um, and what the inflaton, the funny thing about this inflaton field is, what it does is, is it, generically it won't do this, okay? Generically it will appear, um, it, it won't cause a universe to, to expand very quickly. It won't have the right kind of conditions for that to happen. But every so often, it will. Okay, so what this inflaton field does, it takes a little random walk in the beginning of the universe, and eventually it finds itself in just the right conditions to suddenly make that little pocket of the universe expand very quickly. Okay, so if you like, I like to think about this as our friend Ed, Ed Copeland. He's a pretty chilled out guy, right? I mean, we would agree with that, very chilled out. But the thing about Ed is, is um, every so often, I've known him for quite a few years now, and every so often something will rile him. Doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. And then it, he'll explode, and he'll explode the universe around him, right? So it doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. So you can imagine Ed going on a little random walk through town. Okay, most things keep him nice and serene, but every so often something riles him and it, and it blows up. Oh, that's okay, and that's like the inflaton field. So that's kind of how you explain how these quite unlikely scenarios suddenly made our pocket of the universe big. But the thing is, the inflaton, or Ed, doesn't stop doing its little random walks. Okay? In different regions of space, it can do its little random walks here and there. And eventually, sometimes, it can, be, it can jump up back into the right region where it's going to cause this explosion again. Or maybe it never stopped exploding. Okay? So Ed, for example, might calm down, but some, in some regions of space, he, he's being maintained annoyed because of these quantum fluctuations that are, that are keeping him annoyed. Okay, or like the inflaton, it's being kept to maintaining this expansion of space. So you have this eternal process where regions of space are just continue to expand. Our region has stopped expanding at such a huge rate. Okay, the expansion has slowed down somewhat. But, um, but other reasons it doesn't, it just keeps accelerated expansion blowing up at a crazy rate. And so this is making those regions of space enormous. And generally you expect that some regions of space will be behaving like this and are eternally inflating. This is why we call it eternal inflation. And so whilst our region of space have, might have slowed down, that's not true generically. Now, of course, we now know that our region of space is, is starting to speed up again, but that's another story. But what this means is, is that those regions of space outside of our observable universe could be truly gargantuan. And this is where you get all the sort of crazy sort of notions that we talked about in the, in the uh, Googleplex video arising. There's also the idea of Boltzmann brains as well that, that can arise from this, but uh, that's probably another video we should talk about. So one of the important things to realise about level one universes is, is that the laws of physics, the values of the fundamental constants, they're the same here in our corner as they are in those far reaches. Level two is subtly different to that. A level two universe, what you've got to imagine now is, is that there are bubbles. The universe is made up of bubbles. Our corner is living inside of one bubble, where the physical constants are what they are, and so on and so forth. There are other bubbles 
where the physical constants might be different, where the laws of physics look different. What constants uh, are we talking about? Well, now? Planck's constant, you know, the, the New, yeah, Newton's constant, um, you know, fine structure constant. All these constants that underline, you know, physics. Okay, these can change from, from, from bubble to bubble. Now, why might this happen? Well, we believe this could happen because of string theory. String theory tells us that there aren't just one possible universe, one possible vacuum for the universe that you can have. There's an entire plethora of them, 10 to the 500 of them, a huge number. Okay, this is, string theory, when it was first introduced, it was hoped that it would come up with some sort of unique um, vacuum solution, a unique sort of set of circumstances which coincided with the universe we see. And that's not what happened, it was the exact opposite. It came up with a huge number of possibilities. Now, of course, our corner of the universe is just one of those, but generically there's many more. And what will happen is you'll find these bubbles forming. So within one, one bubble, you can have, through quantum tunneling, you can have a bubble of another, uni another type of universe form with different physical constants. And different within the bubble? Or? Yeah, this can happen within the bubble through quantum fluctuations. And so, but then that expansion will occur with it inside that bubble and the, the bubble outside it can expand. And the whole thing sort of, you know, proliferates. You get percolation effects. And you know the whole universe just gets filled with these with these bubbles of different vacua of different where the physical constants are different. Are they? Because I'm thinking of bubbles in a bubble bath, all like you know, stacked up against each other. But what you're talking about there sounds more like Russian <laughs> dolls. Well, no, I mean, yeah, but it's both. Okay, it's both actually. So the bubbles can happen. You know, you could have a bubble nucleate here. Uh, there's a universe inside it where the laws are what they are. Everything's expanding. So your bubble might get bigger, and so you don't really notice, you know, or maybe that bubble will overtake take the other one. It, 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 there's dynamics involved in the whole process. Some bubbles may have an even, even, even experienced different dimensionality, different numbers of dimensions. So if you're in one bubble, you might not experience a four-dimensional universe. You might feel a five or six or seven-dimensional one. What's at the interface between bubbles? Can I drive my car from one bubble to another? Um, well, that would be quite destructive because, of course, the the... The uh, laws that are, are the, you know, the things that's holding your car together, the atomic forces that are holding the whole, and electromagnetic forces that are holding your car together, the physical constants that are controlling that are, are going to change as you traverse the edge of one of these bubbles and enter another bubble. Okay, so what your car looks like when you get to the other side might be something extremely different, and you know, who knows? I don't even want to speculate what it's going to look like, right? Um, so, I mean, the, the the edges of these bubble walls are going to be sort of you know, highly energetic regions um, where basically you're going to get sharp gradients in the in the in in how things are you know things are changing because you know Planck's constant you know is going to perhaps change as you cross one of these walls, and that's going to create a strong gravitational effect in principle, and so these are the sort of things that are happening. So, uh, but the walls themselves don't have to be sort of you know they can be wide walls. They don't have to be sort of particularly thin. They'll be thin compared to, to the bubble as a whole, but you know. It's a, there's, a, there's a transition as you go from one to the other. And one of the things we're actually looking for in the cosmic microwave background is evidence of these bubbles, evidence of bubble collisions. So they're looking for circles in the sky. That's what they're called. It's because you, know, you might see two bubbles colliding. The imprint it would have on the cosmic microwave background would be like a circle, some sort of circular shape within the temperature fluctuations. So we're actually looking for these things. But this is a level two multiverse. And I would say level one's not particularly controversial. Level two, a little more controversial, but still, I mean, if you believe in string theory, you'd probably buy that. Level three, on the other hand, is, I would say, controversial. And this is the idea that, we've, you've already done a video about this, is the idea that, you know, in quantum mechanics, you know, you have this sort of idea of probabilities. So, and whenever there's a, a chance, if ever there's any probability, ever there's any uncertainty, for example, in a coin toss, if we're going to sort of try to picture it classically, you know, picture it sort of macroscopically, it doesn't really make sense to do that. But if you were to try to do that, uh, you might think that whenever you toss a coin, that, that the universe splits in two. And it, on, on, in one way, it, uh, the coin came up heads, and the, on the other way, the coin came up tails, and that both happen. What physical space are two different universes occupying? The same space? Like, like right now, as we continually fork and split and split and split and split and split and split, you know, where are these new universes existing? Well, I think the idea is that it would be right on top of each other, essentially, but you can't interfere from one to the other. There's no way of communicating that. I don't think that's really necessary, though. This is, this is the, I mean, there's a few things I don't like about this. Firstly, you know, you're in, 
whenever you have a split, well, when does the split occur? At which point does the split occur precisely? When is that? I mean, there's already time uncertainty in this, so in quantum mechanics. So when does the split occur? That's not really clearly answered. Secondly, um, you can't just, if you do these splits, then you're, you're increasing, do the splits, <laughs> if you do the splits, you're increasing the number of states suddenly. You're increasing the size of the space that describes the quantum system. And that doesn't seem satisfactory either. Um, but the problem I have is, is that this was originally introduced to, or people like to think about it because they're uncomfortable with the idea of collapse of the wave function. The idea that when you open the box, the cat is either dead or alive and not this mixture. But we actually understand why that is now. It's to do with a process called decoherence where the, the large environment outside of the box starts to mix up with the cat in such a way that, um, that the overlap region between cat dead and cat alive because of the large environmental system outside just gets made very small. So if we're okay with wave function collapse because we understand it through this decoherence, I don't think that we need a, what's wrong with the idea that, that nature's probabilistic? Why do we have to have that every possibility is realized? It's, a quantum mechanics is probabilistic. That's the way nature, nature what is. And just because, um, you know, our classical sort of intuition tells us that, um, you know, we enjoy a, a deterministic existence. It, that doesn't mean quantum mechanics has to behave like that. It doesn't mean nature has to behave like that. It just means that day to day, that's how it seems to behave, but truly it's probabilistic and that's fine. Okay, doesn't mean every possibility has to be realized. So that's level three. So the last of these is the level four, and this is the last one, truly the last one. There is no level five. So the idea of a level four, this is very much Tegmark's thing, um, very much controversial. So the idea of a level four multiverse is the following. We look at our universe, we look at our f physical existence, and we say it's described by a mathematical structure. That seems reasonable, that I can build, build up general relativity from the rules of mathematics, and they, can, and they can describe the universe that I see, for example. Or I can build a standard model from mathematics, and, and I have this mathematical structure, which is the standard model plus general relativity plus all these things, that describes the universe I see. And then you say, OK, but there are other mathematical structures. In fact, there are many more mathematical structures that you can think of. The maths that we use is just oh, that we use to describe, you know, the standard model of general relativity is just one corner of the possible huge realm of mathematical structures that you could imagine. You're saying if I just gave you a blank piece of paper and said, "Go on, Tony, just make up some new mathematical." Exactly, and, and this this is known as the subject of formal systems. That this actually exists. You know, you just need certain operations. You know, do, do, does your mathematical structure include multiplication, for example? It doesn't have to. Ours does that we use to describe the universe that we see. But in principle, you can imagine a mathematical structure that doesn't have multiplication in it. And that's just as good as any other. Okay, so, so there are other mathematical structures. And then you have to ask the question, well, which ones correspond to physical reality? Is it just the one that we speak of? Or is it all of them? Or is it none of them? Well, clearly not none of them. But, you know, it's like, so what Tegmark says, he says, well, I can't really answer that question unless I have mathematical democracy. So he says, I exploit this notion of mathematical democracy that says that all mathematical structures are physically real. So all of them. So they have a physical reality to them. So this is the ultimate multiverse now. That all mathematical structures, not just general relativity, not just string theory, all these things, but anything, any kind of operation that you can create in a formal system, anything that constitutes a mathematical structure is physically real. Okay, and this is quite a dramatic thing. Are, now, you, are you saying each one has its own universe? It is physically real. I mean, the notion of a universe may not even exist in some of them, but it's physically real. So you, you see what I mean? So it's, it's, it's like, it may not even contain gravity. It may not even, it's kind of hard for us to imagine what, what they are because we're so used to thinking about, you know, the one in, in which we're, we're familiar with. But, you know, anything that is, basically it's saying that maths is reality. Okay. Now, why is this, why does Tegmark like this? Well, on one hand, he likes it because it's kind of final in the sense that um, the set of all mathematical structures is itself a mathematical structure. So it's the, it's the end of the road. It sort of completes itself. Um, it also answers or appears to answer a, a question that Wheeler posed, which is why, why of all the possible mathematics that we could have to describe the universe, why this? 
You know, what, what's special about this one? Is there anything special about it? And, well, it seems to answer that. Well, no, there's nothing special about it, that all structures are, are real. Is this like the bubbles? Is this saying that next door to us is a bubble where multiplication doesn't uh, exist? Or? I, I mean, I wouldn't say the bubbles necessarily, because the notion of a bubble might not even exist for some mathematical structures. So, I mean, it's, it, it's so abstract, it's kind of, it is bordering on the, well, it is bordering on the absurd, right? But, I mean, let's think about it, if, if it even makes sense. I mean, on one level, it's not clear that the set of all mathematical structures is well defined. So that's a problem. There's also, this is challenged by Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which says that uh, there are some things which are, which are true, but, um, but can't be proven to be true. And, uh, you know, is that, if you have a universe where that's the case, if you have a mathematical structure which is like that, can that properly de describe a universe? It, there seems to be some sort of weakness there. And in fact, Ted Mark has uh, lessened his, his statement to suggest that actually only Gödel complete mathematical structures are physically real. Um, but again, I think it comes back to, for me, it comes back to the, the same debate that one would have with the, with the level three multiverses. Just because um, they can exist, and just because you can still have mathematical democracy, but why, why do they have to exist? Can't we just have they exist with a certain probability? Can't we just build that into it? Why is it, and, and maybe we could have some sort of measure amongst the, the multiverse of, uh, of possible mathematical structures and just say, and ours happens to be the one that was picked out with a certain probability. That's fine. It doesn't mean all the others have to actually physically exist. So that's level four. So as I said, I think uh, level one, pretty uncontroversial. Level two, not too controversial. And uh, level three and four, well, make of them what you will. But, you know, it's, it's sometimes just fun thinking about these things. It's just a nice idea. It's almost like it's science fiction, but serious science fiction. Because again, reality, to me at least, means that it has some testable consequences. You know, something, for something to be real, you have to be able to interact with it in some way.